Good evening. Welcome to ITV News. This is Wednesday night's calendar. Hello. These are tonight's main stories. A North Yorkshire army garrison is announced as a potential new site to house people seeking asylum. I'm here in Catterick to gauge reaction to the possibility that the town's historic barracks could be used as an asylum centre. They will relieve pressure on our communities and they will manage asylum seekers in a more appropriate and cost-effective way. A grieving family's fight for an independent investigation into the death of their son who was training to be a police officer. They failed him. They failed. I sent my happy boy to the forces and what, look what they did. Also on calendar this evening, why new homes can still be doer-uppers. This light above the bath is hanging down loose. The booming market for snaggers in new builds and... There's nothing like league. How Women's Rugby League has grown from the grassroots as they get ready for the biggest season yet. So first tonight, the government's announced Catrick Garrison in North Yorkshire could be used to house asylum seekers who arrive on UK shores in small boats. Catrick is home to Europe's largest army base and is close to the A1 in Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's Richmond constituency. In a surprise announcement in the House of Commons, the Immigration Minister said that Rishi Sunak was showing leadership by using his own constituency to help solve the spiralling costs of housing asylum seekers in hotels. Well, in a moment we'll be crossing to our political correspondent Katie Oscroft. But first, let's go to Catrick, where Fraser Maud has been hearing from locals who tonight find themselves under the political spotlight. It certainly comes a bit of a bolt out of the blue, this one. Robert Jenrick, the Immigration Minister, was making an announcement in the Commons about military bases that have been approved as asylum centres in Sussex, Essex and at RAF Scampton in Lincolnshire. But then he threw Catrick into the mix. My right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, is showing leadership on this issue by bringing forward proposals to provide accommodation at Catterick Garrison Barracks. Funding will be provided to local authorities in which these sites are located. Madam Deputy Speaker, these sites are undoubtedly in the national interest. Well, if they want to push these proposals through, one thing that is in their favour is apparently the support of the local constituency MP, who happens to be the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. What it's got going against it is that it's still very much an operational military base, unlike the others that have been approved, which have already been decommissioned. So what's been the reaction where you are, Fraser? Well, as you might imagine, a bit of a mixed bag, Ian. Uh, people I've been speaking to off camera very much opposed to the possibility of this being used as an asylum centre. Other people that we spoke to, though, perhaps a little bit more pragmatic. There's a lot of, like, you know, soldiers on the streets, like, kind of thing, which I think is an issue, especially in Catrick, being a military base. But um, I think, yeah, I just think, you know, they need to go somewhere. I'd be happy for that to happen, yes. Definitely. They need a home as well, aren't they, as asylum seekers? People have a right to be safe and feel safe. And, you know, if, if they want to come here, that's fine. I think it's a great idea for the government to be doing that, really, more than anything, yeah. Well, this has come as a bit of a surprise, as we've said, so much so that it's only within the last hour or so that North Yorkshire County Council have issued a statement saying we currently have very limited information regarding the potential for any asylum seekers to be housed at Catterick Garrison. We await full details and will then want to understand any impact on the services we deliver before making any further comment. What is for sure is that any proposals for Catrick Garrison are very much in their infancy and there'll no doubt be a lengthy consultation progress before any progress can be made. Fraser Maud at Catrick Garrison, thank you. Well, let's head to Westminster where the announcement was made this afternoon and where our political correspondent Katie Oscroft was watching. 
It was out of the blue. The sites of the other military bases were an open secret here, but Catrick, of course, is a working garrison and there was no hint that this was on the cards. The constituents MP, who of course is the Prime Minister, wasn't in the Commons today. He was at the funeral of the former Speaker, Betty Boothroyd, but the Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, was. And she said the sheer scale, the numbers involved in the migrant crisis, were all of the Conservative Party's doing. Four years ago, the Cabinet said they would halve channel crossings. They've gone up 20-fold since then. A year ago, they said they'd end hotel use. They've opened more than ever. They keep making new announcements, but it just keeps getting worse. Yeah. We need to end costly and inappropriate hotel use, but these plans don't do that. Well, Labour there saying they don't believe that we'll see an end to the use of hotels, which are currently costing £6 million a day. But the plans for Catrick are not as clear as for the other military bases, which are no longer in use and will provide what's been described as cheaper but humane accommodation. The Immigration Minister, Robert Jenrick, described the use of surplus military sites. Well, Catrick is not surplus. It is still in use. And the official line on it is that it will provide accommodation uh, in due course. So when or whether we will see asylum seekers at Catrick remains to be seen. Katie, thank you. The Prime Minister, as Katie said, was among the politicians past and present who paid their respects at the funeral of Baroness Betty Boothroyd today. Resume his seat immediately. Immediately! The Dewsbury born former MP was the first and only female elected Speaker of the House of Commons. Rishi Sunak said at her funeral this morning that Baroness Boothroyd was a remarkable woman. Labour leader Sakir Starmer and the current Speaker Sir Lindsay Hoyle were also in attendance. Next, the family of a student West Yorkshire police officer who they believe took his own life after allegedly experiencing bullying and institutional racism at the force are calling for an independent investigation. It's claimed 21-year-old Anugra Abraham was, among other things, asked to carry out a search on a dead body alone, despite only being a trainee, and was often criticised and insulted in front of colleagues. He was found dead earlier this month. The police watchdog has ordered West Yorkshire Police to investigate. His family has been speaking to Michael Billington. We were so proud to see him in uniform. He brought the uniform home and we all trying his hat. And he was saying, be careful, mom, this is my uniform. Just feel so proud to be his mom. Anu Gray Abraham dreamed of being a police officer, but his family say even before he qualified, the job cost him his life. The system didn't do anything for him. He broke down in tears. He said, I can't do it anymore. It was too much for me. They failed him. They failed. I sent my happy boy to the forces and would look what they did. They didn't look after him at all. They did not look after him. Anugre disappeared earlier this month. He was found dead the following day. His family blames bullying and institutional racism on the part of West Yorkshire Police. In one incident, the student officer was allegedly asked to carry out a search on a corpse by himself. It made him physically sick. I've never seen something like this. He was not prepared. Then, so, so they said, no, carry on. So he said he vomited first and then he told, they told him to do the full body search. So he did, but he didn't feel comfortable after that. So many days he was feeling it, he was feeling it, he was feeling it. That's why I'm very angry. That's why I'm going to ask so many questions. You know why they didn't do anything for my son? He could be here with us sitting right next to me. Something triggered him so bad that he took this decision. If he gets supported, he would be here with us. Yeah. He was not supported at all. He was not. He was crying for help yeah. and nobody helped him. The police watchdog has ordered West Yorkshire police to investigate the case. His family say that's simply not enough. They have blood on their hands. And we have seen it over and over again, which is that these institutions protect themselves first. And we have no confidence that they are going to be able to say, put their hand up and say, yes, sorry, we are guilty. That's not going to happen. Somebody else needs to do that investigation for sure. I don't know what more it will need the public watchdog to do what it's supposed to. How many more lives do we have to lose? 
Well, Michael, it was heartbreaking to watch your report there. Obviously, you're with us in the studio now. Both West Yorkshire Police and the police watchdog facing questions tonight. What have they had to say? Well, West Yorkshire Police themselves have said that they were saddened to hear of PC Abraham's death and added that they take all allegations of bullying and discrimination within the force very seriously and are committed to investigating such reports. But as you heard from Anu Gray's family there, they say it's just not right that West Yorkshire Police are allowed to mark their own homework, if you like, to, to investigate themselves. And so the Independent Office for Police Conduct have told us tonight that uh, his family will have the right to have the force's handling of the matter reviewed by the IOPC upon conclusion of the investigation, ensuring what they say will be an appropriate level of independent oversight should it be required. The family is now also pushing to have a meeting with the Home Secretary so that they can press for what they consider to be a thorough and independent investigation. Michael, thank you. Keep us updated with that one. You're watching Canada, still to come before the end of the programme. Chris will be here with takeover news about Huddersfield Town Plus. We became milder than average across the region today, but with a lot of cloud around and showery outbreaks of rain, milder still tomorrow. But what about the sunshine? All the detail a little later on. Now imagine you've just moved into your dream house. It's a new build. And how confident would you be checking that everything is as it should be? Well, a leading consumer group wants more people to call in a professional. Mm, interesting. I've experienced this myself, actually. Here in Yorkshire, the number of new build houses is increasing year on year. And that's one of the reasons why Witch says homeowners should consider a professional snagger. James Webster has been to investigate whether they're worth the cost. Getting the keys to your new home is a big day. And checking it all up to scratch can be daunting. I'd normally fill up all of the uh, basins to the overflow to check for leaks. Which is why so many people are now calling in a professional snagger. This light above the bath is hanging down loose. People like Alex who'll spend around three or four hours checking this place over. What sort of things are you looking for as you go round a new house like this? So in a bedroom like this, I'd be checking that the gaps around the door meet the warranty provider's standards, uh, making sure the light switches and sockets are level and there's no scratches if they're chrome like these ones. The number of new homes being built has risen significantly over the last decade, but the biggest rise was last year. In Yorkshire and northern Lincolnshire, there were almost 14,000. And across the UK, there were almost 192,000. An independent survey found 9 out of 10 buyers were satisfied with the overall quality and 8 out of 10 with how it was finished. But then it's for the minority of people who might not be satisfied that the consumer group which recommends getting a professional snagger. Although other surveys might cover kind of major structural issues, they're not going to tell you, say, if a door just doesn't close or there's an issue with a kitchen worktop. Alex has now moved downstairs and found more potential issues. So one of the things we do is check radiators for sludge and air and make sure the heating zones are correct. If we look at the hallway radiator here, you can see there's a pocket of air in the top compared with the living room one, which is heating up properly. Oh, that's really good. It's my first time to see my house one uh, since we placed it all the last July. And then we're just not sure whether there's a potential uh, force or anything, when the, especially on the new bill. That's why we just arranged some professional to help us to see any potential things we need to be taken care of. Wendy can now pass on the list of snags that have been identified to her builder and ask for them to be fixed. Some, she says, she wouldn't have found by herself. Then she's looking forward to getting settled in her new home. James Webster, ITV News. And if you have got a new home, hope you enjoy it. Now, the ITV Evening News continues at 6.30. Here's a look at what's happening with Mary Nightingale. Coming up in the programme, shock and sadness at the death of television star Paul O'Grady. The Queen Consort led tributes to the star, saying he lit up the lives of so many people. We look back at his fearless campaigning, his rise to stardom and, of course, his love of dogs. Also on the programme, calls to expand the number of children eligible for free school meals. A warning that we are a decade behind in our preparations for climate change and... 
the king in Berlin. Charles makes his first state visit as monarch. Will you join me for those stories and more at 6.30? We will, Mary. Thank you very much. Well, it's certainly warming up, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly was going to, and it has. Bradford was one of our warmer places today. 15, the average is about 12, but quite cloudy, wasn't it, today? Mm. Yeah, a bit better tomorrow. More sunshine, perhaps, but also some showers and some warmth. And it's that combination that, yes, will be good for the gardens, I suspect, but also spark off some tree pollen. Now, as we head through into tomorrow, we are expecting it to rise pretty much for the first time. Elm and Hazel are the main culprits, and we've got a moderate count across most parts of the calendar region for tomorrow. And just for tomorrow only with that combination of the blue sky and the warmth and the sunshine. And also what we get when we get sunny spells and showers are rainbows. We've had some low bows um, over the last few weeks, so I've been saving them up. Um, a few low bows. This is what we'd normally expect, a typical rainbow, the higher rainbow, directly at sunrise and sunset. We have it uh, the centre of the whole bow at the horizon. But as the sun rises during the morning, the bows get lower and lower as the centre sinks below the horizon. So they kind of look a little bit like this around midday, just before midday. So that's oh, what I, I suspected. Never knew that. There you go. <laughs> and when it's directly above you, guess what it is? A high bow? A no bow! Oh. <laughs> because you won't see anything because you're basically stood in the water droplets that would give you the refraction and the reflection from the sunrise. Oh, every day is a school day. I try, I do try. <laughs> Um, just very quickly, you might have heard that there's a storm coming on Friday. We've been tracking this area of low pressure here in the Atlantic. As it heads towards us, it's really probably France's problem. They might name it as a storm. Southern parts of the UK, cloudy, wet and windy for us. Just a pretty cloudy and dab end to the week, I think. And of course, the forecast is a little further on. Great stuff. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Now, you've got cats, haven't you? Yes. 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 So Two you'll, cats. Well, you'll know that going to the vets, it can be expensive. It can be. Yeah, we had uh, one of our cats uh, had a little heart murmur and had to have some uh, like monitoring done, Aww. and that cost hundreds of pounds. Yes. Well, even the smallest of things can cost a lot of money. With many of us struggling with rising costs at the moment, new research shows that many pet owners are delaying taking their sick animals to the vet for fear of high bills. Ninety-nine percent of vets questioned by the British Veterinary Association say they're seeing pets that should have been brought in for treatment sooner. And there are fears these delays could be putting animals' lives at risk. Amrit Birdie reports. More than half of households in the UK are home to a pet, whether that be a dog, a cat or even a duck. Jo Nutkins and her pet duck Echo are inseparable. But when Echo became ill a few months ago, Jo was landed with a bill of over a thousand pounds, which she simply couldn't afford. In the end, she had to set up a fundraising page. Some people have very kindly donated. People, some people I know, some people that I've never met have donated. Um, and that was a big help to help pay um, towards some of those costs. We are still paying off some of those costs. Um, I'm pleased to say that Echo is doing really, really well and she hasn't needed to go back. It is something that's on our mind, especially where the cost of living has gone up so much recently. This veterinary surgery in Leeds says they've seen plenty of people with poorly pets that are delaying bringing them in for treatment. Sometimes treatments done sooner are more effective rather than later, or maybe they'll be kind of more further on in, in the disease process if they come later and there may be less that we can, we can offer at that stage. The British Veterinary Association says that delaying treatment could make a pet's illness even worse and result in higher bills later down the line. It's also really important to remember to keep your pet's preventative health up to date. So make sure your pet is being fed the right diet, that it's not getting overweight, that you're brushing its teeth and looking after things like vaccinations and routine health checks. The PDSA found almost half of pet owners are worried about how they'd afford to pay for an unexpected pet bill and the cost of insurance is also a major concern. But there is some help on hand as the charity provides free and low cost treatment to pets in need. Last year alone we, we treated over 330 thousand pets, some of those with emergency conditions, some of those with just kind of more routine things. Um, we, we do kind of anticipate that demand for the service is going to increase as the cost of living continues. But if you're losing sleep over fears of a trip to the vets, pet owners are being told prevention is better than a cure. Amrit Birdie, ITV News.
Do you brush your cat's teeth? <laughs> <laughs> you know, our cats are lovely. I've never once been scratched by them Aww. in all the time we've had them. But I don't think they'd want their teeth <laughs> No, brushed. I really don't think <laughs> they'd like would. to try. Time for some like sport it. now, anyway. And Chris is here to tell us about a prospective new order at Huddersfield Town, Chris. Yeah, this statement released last night has put a bit more meat on the bones in terms of this takeover at Huddersfield Town. The man with the money has been unmasked and... It's this fella coming up. That's American Kevin M. Nagel. Now, he's been described as a businessman and investor and is the current owner of California-based team Sacramento Republic, who play in the USL Championship. That's the second tier of American soccer, as they call it. Now, if Nagel does complete his takeover, which, of course, is subject to checks from the football authorities, it'll end Dean Hoyle's 14-year association with Huddersfield. He was, of course, the chairman when Town won promotion to the Premier League in 2017. Now, as for matters on the pitch, well, once it wasn't a good night for Barnsley for once. The Tykes were up against it as soon as Jay Stansfield danced around the defence and fired Exeter ahead. Bobby Thomas did equalise when he was left all alone from a free kick, but the 450 or so travelling fans had a long, unhappy journey back to South Yorkshire after the home side scored twice in the second half to end Barnsley's 12-match unbeaten run. Meanwhile, the date has been announced for Sheffield United's FA Cup semi-final at Wembley. The Blades who beat Blackburn in the quarter-finals have been given 34,000 tickets for the match against Manchester City on Saturday, April 22nd. The kickoff is at 4.45pm and there'll be live coverage of that one right here on ITV. Now, it's coming up to six months since the Rugby League World Cup. Yeah. It doesn't seem to have got... It's, it, six months has flown by, hasn't it? I know. Yeah, it, it doesn't go, seem it like two minutes ago. It goes just as quick as a flash, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Though, I mean, the women's game specifically has gone leaps and bounds. The World Cup was hailed as the most inclusive ever with the men's, women's and wheelchair competitions all taking place at the same time. The women's final saw Australia beat New Zealand, two teams of fully professional players. Well, professionalism is an ambition for the women's game here in this country as well. And with the new Super League season kicking off next week, we're starting to edge a little bit closer to it. There's nothing like league, and this is the Betfred Women's Super League. It has its own glitzy promotional video, and this week at Headingley, the new Women's Super League season held its official launch. It's a far cry from where Women's Rugby League was when these players first started out. You were cleaning the pitch, you know, before you were playing, you know, you were trying to find players to, to be in the squad for that weekend game and, and now it's like you're fighting for your positions, there's strength and depth, you know, you've got this great backing, um, you know, we're playing at massive stadiums and it just goes to show where it, where it's come. Yeah, I've got nieces that are young, like young nieces and like they're all playing sports and I just think it's amazing to see like the difference between when I was younger and playing sports to compared to now, it's great. Women's Rugby League has never been more popular. Since 2016, the number of women's and girls teams has increased by 200%. And the opening game of last year's World Cup at Headingley was the most attended women's rugby league match ever in the Northern Hemisphere. England star Jodie Cunningham, who's also the National Women's and Girls Development Manager, believes this is just the start. Hopefully, you know, I think we did the country proud and a lot of people got involved in the game and, and fell in love with rugby league because of what we did. And I think that's all really helped then to inspire some of the young girls uh, to take up the sport and want to be part of what I think is the best sport in the world. Well, in what is a seminal moment, not just for rugby league in this country, but women's sport in general, this season, both Leeds and York are giving their players bonuses depending on performance, which means for the first time ever in this country, women are being paid to play rugby league. Just a, a small amount of money can go a long way, can't it? Especially for a woman in sport that's, you know, got kids at home, you know, for childcare and, you know, it, the list is as long as my arm, isn't it? It's, it? it's massive. From all, like, the students and girls who are probably working part-time and fitting, like, education around work, uh, yeah, it's going to be huge to them. It's going to be, you know, um, petrol in the cars, maybe car, car maintenance, getting them to training, so, yeah. Right, OK, eyes on me. Since 2017, the Super League has grown from just four teams to 12. Leeds and York actually kick off the new season on Easter Sunday. So for the first time, the winners will earn more than just pride. Yeah, certainly a sport that's growing. Now, just before I go, I just wanted to throw this in to make you feel just a little bit better. Ah, leather on willow, the quintessential sound of summer. Well, 
for me anyway, growing next door to a cricket club. I was up at Headingley today just to get a few shots of Yorkshire taking on Durham in a pre-season friendly. The new cricket season gets underway a week tomorrow and I, for one, cannot wait. I know, it'll be great. Cream teas as well. Oh, cream teas? <laughs> cricket? Yeah, well, maybe. Whatever you fancy. Got to laugh there. It really looked like summer did it at the grey skies. It isn't did, it? yeah. Typical yeah. British summer. We'll get there, we'll get there. <laughs> Love it. Thank it you very warm, much indeed. Though. Right, well, it uh, certainly is warm enough for cricket, so uh, let's find out now what the weather has in store from Kerry. Good visibility on the horizon. Tui. Sponsors ITV Yorkshire Weather. Hello again. Yes, it was disappointing today in terms of cloud amounts. They say the early bird catches the worm. Probably caught the best of the weather conditions as well today. A beautiful sunrise across many parts of the region, whether you were inland or out towards the coast. It was quite quickly a cloudy story from the west. But as we head through into tomorrow, it will continue to be mild. We will see some sunshine but also showers, heavy at times, never too far away. But yesterday, cloudy skies and shower outbreaks invading from both the west and the south, and that will continue to be the case as we head deeper into tonight. So yes, there might be a brief respite to drier, clearer conditions, but generally cloudy and showery, some of those showers heavy, and quite breezy conditions and therefore quite mild, nothing much lower than around 7 or 8 Celsius overnight tonight. There are your sun times for tomorrow against this morning's sunrise, 6.45 and 7.37. Tomorrow, still quite a few showers a risk first thing, then some sunshine developing, then the showers getting going again for the second half of the day. So essentially, sunshine and showers, some of the showers could be heavy, but temperature-wise could be up to 16, 17, and always quite blustery from that southwesterly direction. We look to the south for this area of low pressure, skirting the south of the UK, but for us, it will bring a colder easterly as Friday progresses, so it will start to feel fresh, especially out towards the coast. Cloudy skies, showery outbreaks of rain, and then as we head into the weekend, we're left with a generally cooler theme, with winds from a northerly quarter. The temperatures back down to average or below as the weekend progresses, and we think quite a bit of cloud around too. TUI sponsors ITV Yorkshire Weather. And there you go, that's your forecast. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we'll just watch out for a storm on Friday. I can't wait. Possibly. Just as the weekend's coming. Fingers. Yeah, there we go. Easter holes. <laughs> That's all for now. Uh, Matt will be back at 10.30. From all of us, though, until tomorrow at 6, a very good night. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>